with any kyphotic deformity, yes, you want to correct the, the kyphosis and also restore alignment, restore balance, and decompress the nerve roots. And that can be done. It's a, a significant surgery. Uh, it involves several pedicle screws, rods, um, and, and you know, extension of the fusion, essentially. And in her case, she was 81 years old. She had significant osteoporosis and poor nutrition. Not, I mean, she made a great effort at nutrition, but she'd had several abdominal surgeries before. And so in her case, her likelihood of complication and poor recovery and poor tissue healing um, was pretty significant. Not to mention the fact that in these kyphotic deformities with osteoporosis, the hardware can easily fail, screws can pull out. And she had had ablations before uh, by a pain physician, and those ablations had sent, essentially denervated the spinal muscles, all those extensors and paraspinal support, and that contributes significantly to a kyphotic deformity. Her muscles were atrophied along this posterior aspect of the spine, and it's kind of like, um, ablations are kind of like if you cut the cables on a suspension bridge. It, it can't have all this tensegrity structure that supports everything in the proper position. And so by denervating it, you essentially atrophy and um, alter the biomechanics in a way that's detrimental in the long run. Plus, they had never really provided her relief. She had also had epidural steroid injections by a pain physician. Those epidural steroid injections had contributed to worsening osteoporosis of the bones, worsening weakening of the annular ligament around the disc, um, which gives more mobility and more degenerative collapse, and a worse arthritis of the facet joints because steroids are well known to suppress collagen synthesis and degrade and disintegrate uh, cartilage. And those joints are essentially like cartilaginous synovial joints. And for all those reasons, um, I think in the long run, those things did her more harm than good. And so I presented a few options to her. The, uh, you know, the extensive fusion surgery, the correction of kyphotic deformity would be highly risky, highly detrimental, long recovery. And it's sort of a last uh, option if, uh, if that's even an option at all. Um, a better solution is uh, to avoid the ablations, avoid the epidural steroid injection. Since there was some component of trans uh, or of ligamentum flavum here that was also uh, hypertrophied and compressive on the posterior aspect of the cord, um, there is possibly a role for minimally invasive resection of the ligamentum flavum, but. In her case, I think that would be quite destabilizing, and so I don't think that would have been a, a great idea. So instead, what I offered her is a, a more minimally invasive approach where we essentially took in this transferaminal approach with a small little camera, and this is that camera. So it's one of the smallest cameras in the world, and basically, by guiding this in here, we were able to see the T1 nerve root as it exits its foramen here. And there's a lot of tools you can use to open up that space. One is just mobilization of the nerve root, also with blunt uh, nerve retractor and, and also just pushing the ligamentum flavum and using a needle and possibly, possibly some resection as necessary. But for the most part, the, the nerve was able to be mobilized and with a little hydrodissection around the nerve root to take any pressure off. And just those simple, minimally invasive things was able to decompress the nerve enough that she had significant relief even during the procedure. This is done under conscious sedation, so you don't actually need to be fully asleep with a tube in your throat. Um, you can be awake and giving feedback and yet be comfortable during the entire thing. In addition, after that part of the procedure, I just tracked back along this T1 nerve root to the interscalene exit here and made sure that this exit was not compressed between the scalene muscles. And we just did a little dab of regenerative agents around the nerve root and around this uh, lower cord here, just to open up space around the nerve sheath to help remyelination. And then further out at the supraclavicular portion of the brachial plexus, I just put little droplets of steroid around the nerve sheath here to calm it down. And that way you can get some benefits of the steroid on the nerve itself 
without having to have all the detrimental effects of steroid at the facet joints and degenerative discs and with the osteoporosis and everything else. So you kind of get the benefits on the nerve with none of the downsides on the spine. Uh, everything we did in the spine was regenerative. So in addition to tucking into the T1 nerve exit here, I also just tucked a transferminal approach again against the disc there and bathed it with a PRF scaffolding. It's like a sticky scaffolding that gives more stability to those annular ligaments to help hold it in place and prevent further sliding forward, which eventually could possibly paralyze her. Um, and I also followed this nerve root down with ultrasound all the way to the cubital tunnel. And at the cubital tunnel, there was also some, a little bit of nerve dilation, which can show again, some compressive effect. It's an inability uh, to, of the nerve to deliver nutrients up and down the nerve terminals. And so we did a little bit of decompression there at the ulnar nerve as well. Even though that's not the primary site of concern, it actually still is therapeutic to the nerve and uh, eventually will help diminish her Tinel sign as well. And so with all those treatments, um, and then lastly, tucking in right here through the facet joints and bathing these, bathing the cartilage that's wearing away uh, and the arthritis and bathing that with a cushion of PRF and stem cells, we were able to lubricate those joints and help them to sit higher and be a little more stabilized. It also has a great effect on the synovial capsule for those joints to tighten it down and to calm the inflammation so it doesn't expand and effuse and sag. And so all those things, each, and no, each one by itself is a small thing, but ultimately it adds up quite significantly. And she was feeling great after the procedure. She was able to walk out of the clinic with none of that shooting nerve pain going down her arms and she continues to feel significantly better and gain more and more improvements each day. Oh, and the last thing that I did is also to tuck those stem cells and PRF scaffolding through the musculature along the posterior extensors of the spine to try to bulk up and build some core musculature back along with good physical therapy. So for all those reasons, um, I think that that leads to better outcomes, better function, uh, lower pain scores, better quality of life, faster recovery, and if necessary, you can always go and do bigger and bigger surgeries, but those surgeries almost always tend to lead to further and further surgeries. And so um, I think if you can avoid going down that road and take uh, a more minimally invasive approach and a more reparative approach, like with more regenerative agents, that leads to the best outcomes, the best restoration of quality of life, the best recoveries and resolution of symptoms and uh, avoids a lot of the detrimental things that are uh, high risk, especially in a patient like this. So I hope that's interesting. I hope that explains kind of my line of reasoning and thought on these kinds of complex cases. Thank you.